The third economic goal is that of full employment. Now it's important to note here that true full employment, so everybody who wants a job and is willing and able to work has a job, that's really not possible. So when we talk about full employment, we're accepting the fact that you're always going to have some unemployment. There's always going to be a little bit in terms of people looking for work who can't find work. So it's important that we define the different types of unemployment. We accept that we will always have some frictional unemployment. This is voluntary. So let's suppose that uh, you are tired of the the warm weather, the, the flat plains of Saskatchewan, and you want to move to uh, Vancouver or Victoria Island where uh, there's lots of bright flowers and nice weather. Well, if you quit your job, move, and then go to Vancouver and look for work, you are frictionally unemployed. Now, we're okay with some frictional unemployment because it's a choice that we make uh, to do something else to go somewhere else. We also recognize that we are going to have some structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is unemployment that occurs because there has been a change in society's demand patterns. So think about it. Maybe uh, you work and uh, you work for a company that makes uh, VHS cassettes. Right? Well, Today, how many people are buying uh, their movies on VHS, right? We don't do that anymore. So it doesn't make sense that we would continue to make those products. And so since people's demand for goods and services changes over time, there, of course, is going to be unemployment as the factory that makes VHS cassettes closes down and those who were trained to do so have to look for alternative employment. So because we're not going to always make the same goods and services as our grandparents and their grandparents, there is going to be structural unemployment. So when we talk about full employment, we define full employment as having an unemployment rate. So the percentage who are looking for work and can't find it, somewhere between 4 and 6.4%. This definition comes from the organization from for economic cooperation and development. So if we take those competitive economies across the world, uh, they make up the OECD. And we define then full employment as having an unemployment rate between 4 and 6.4%. That allows for some frictional and structural unemployment. Why is it a band from 4 to 6.4%? Well, that's because there are slight differences in how countries measure the unemployment rate. And so to allow for that, uh, and the structure of different economies, uh, there is a range from 4 to 6.4%. So full employment, how do we measure that? Well, we measure full employment by looking at the unemployment rate. We're looking at the percentage of people who are looking for work but can't find it. Well, how do we get the unemployment rate to go down and that way we're closer to full employment, we need to stimulate the economy. So when it comes to full employment, full employment typically goes hand in hand with economic growth. And economic growth goes hand in hand uh, with a higher standard of living. So typically when you achieve one of those first three goals, you're achieving the other two as well. They move together. Now, the challenge we have with the goal of full employment is that the next goal we're going to talk about is steady prices, right? So we have to look at the relationship between employment and inflation. And so here on the right, what you see is what is called the Phillips curve. And it shows the relationship between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. The unemployment rate always goes on the horizontal axes. So in this case, the unemployment rate is causing changes to the price level, to the inflation rate. So let's, let's walk through these pieces. So let's suppose that the unemployment rate is high. 
That is, there's lots of people looking for jobs who can't find jobs. Well, if you are one of those people that's looking for work, so unemployment is high, you're looking for work, it means you have lots of competition. Lots of other people to compete with for those jobs. Well, if you're the company looking to hire, who do you hire? You have lots of choice. Well, you're going to hire the best workers, and you're going to hire the best worker for the least. So you're going to find whoever's the best but won't cost you as much. So if we're hiring the best for the least, it's going to cause wages to go down. Well, if wages fall, then the cost to make our goods and services will go down. And if the cost to make goods and services go down, then that means the prices that businesses charge will also fall. So what happens is when the unemployment rate is high, the inflation rate is low. The other way you can look at this is when the unemployment rate is high, then we don't have any jobs, which means our income is lower. And if we have less income, we are not buying as much goods and services. Well, how do businesses get rid of their goods and services if people aren't buying them? They put them on sale. And so that's also driving down those prices. Now, what about when the unemployment rate is low? Well, when the unemployment rate is low, then there's not a lot of competition in terms of who to hire. So as a business, how do you keep the good workers? How do you keep them from going to the competition? Well, you have to convince them to stay with your company by offering better benefits, better wages, and when wages go up, the cost to the business to make the goods and services go up, and of course then the prices of those goods and services go up. So when the unemployment rate is low, prices increase, and we have inflation. We can also look at it from the perspective of uh, income. So when the unemployment rate is low, we all have lots of jobs, which means we have more income. And when you have more cash in your pocket, you're going to buy more. And when you buy more, then what happens is that increase in demand, so we're all fighting each other for those goods and services, and that drives up prices as well. So the Phillips curve shows us this inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. When unemployment is high, prices fall, and when unemployment is low, prices go up. So it's very difficult to achieve simultaneously the goals of full employment and the goal of stable prices. Well, let's look at where we are right now in terms of employment. So here you can see Canada's unemployment rate over time. This increase we see in the unemployment rate, that was the 2008-2009 recession, and since then the unemployment rate has been falling. This big spike that you see here, 1930, that was the Great Depression, and our unemployment rate in Canada was about 20%. Now, in the 70s, so here, we are seeing an increase in unemployment. And the 70s are an interesting time period because um, historically it's really the only time we've seen both the unemployment rate and the inflation rate go up at the same time. So in the 70s, we have this period that we call stagflation. So stagflation is a period of high unemployment and high prices. Now according to the Phillips curve, this shouldn't be possible. When the unemployment rate goes up, 
prices should do what? They, they should fall. Well, they didn't in the 70s. Well, what was different about the 70s? Well, what we had in the 70s was a supply shock and overregulation. So let's walk through the process. So what we had in the 70s was a decrease. Oops, sorry, let's undo that. There was a decrease in the supply of oil. So OPEC, the Middle East, which produced mostly oil at the time, they decreased their supply. So if there's less oil available, there's now a shortage, and that does what to price? Makes it go up. So the price of oil went up. Well, we need gas in our cars. We need gas to get to work. And we need gas to transport goods and services, right? How do you get your apples to the grocery store? They had to be brought in. So when the price of oil goes up, the price of everything goes up. All right, so now goods and services are more expensive. Well, if they're more expensive, we can't afford many of them, so we buy less. So price goes up, we buy less. Well, what this should do is this should then cause those prices to fall back down, right? Decrease in demand causes prices to fall. But because of the supply shock, the prices couldn't fall when we bought less because it was costing more to make it. Well, if you're a business and uh, people aren't buying your goods, you don't need as many workers because you don't need to make as many goods and services since they're not selling. Well, if people get laid off, uh, the unemployment rate goes up. So we see here is high prices and high unemployment. Well, according to the Phillips curve, if the unemployment rate goes up, then there should be a fall in wages, in costs, in prices. Well, at the same time this was happening, we decided to fix the problem by first increasing the money supply so if we have more cash in circulation, maybe people will buy more goods and services. Well, if you now have more cash in circulation, that's more money chasing after the same goods, and that creates inflation. Prices go up even more. Right? Same number of goods, but we have more cash, and so uh, prices start to go up. At the same time, our solution was to regulate the market. So what we did is we said, okay, people can't afford the goods and services, let's create a minimum wage. That is, businesses can't lower price, can't lower uh, the wages that they pay. Everyone must pay at least a certain amount. Well, according to the Phillips curve, when the unemployment rate goes up, then you're going to hire the best for the least and wages tend to fall to kind of get the economy to bounce back on its own. Well, if wages can't fall because uh, we've interfered with the market, then uh, the economy can't uh, bounce back. Wages don't fall, costs don't go down, prices don't go down. And remember, we have that high cost of oil uh, keeping the cost up. And so the economy here couldn't fix itself. So stagflation was a unique period of time, uh, unlike anything we had seen before. And it gave rise uh, to new philosophies and economics which we will talk about later this semester. So where do we currently stand when it comes to uh, full employment? Well, we can look at the unemployment rate here on the right, and we can see uh, the average unemployment rate for Canada is about 6.3% compared to Alberta at 7.8, and the U.S is about 4.4 percent. So the US has a lower unemployment rate right now, their economy is growing faster than ours is, 
and uh, they are essentially at full employment. On the left, you can see uh, youth unemployment. Of course, youth unemployment tends to be higher than the general population. Uh, this is 2015 that we're looking at here when Canada's youth unemployment was about 12.9%. Countries like Greece, Spain, Italy uh, have really high youth unemployment. And so a lot of them, what we hear in the news about protesting in the streets, um, that's because of this high unemployment rate. Now, when we talk about full employment and the U.S. being at full employment, what does that really mean? Well, the reason that we have this full employment or natural rate is to note at which the point where the unemployment rate has fallen, that if it went even further, it would hurt the economy. So at this point, everybody who wants a job has a job, allowing for some frictional and structural unemployment. If your unemployment rate falls even further, the problem then is that uh, you have more jobs than you have workers, which means you can't keep your economy running. Uh, so for example, uh, after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, they had more jobs than they had workers. And so businesses were only open for one or two hours uh, a day, so only open for lunch, 11 to 1, uh, because they couldn't get enough workers to keep the business open all day long. So having too low of an unemployment rate uh, can hurt your economy. It can also lead to huge inflation, right? Low unemployment, high inflation, because if we can't keep our business running during the day, because we can't find enough workers, then we have to pay our workers more and more. So the full, or the full employment or natural rate is the rate at which if it drops below, you start to see in more and more inflation. So as we look at employment, who do you think is the world's largest employer? So we can see here the biggest employer in the world is actually the U.S. Department of Defense and they employ about 3.2 million people as of 2010. Uh, the Chinese Army is the second largest employer in the world, uh, followed by Walmart and McDonald's.